Buenas noches, everyone. <laughs> Wisdom for life and leadership. When you went to school or university, was there any course on marriage? Or how to be a partner? How to have a relationship? Was there any education on how to be a parent? I think there should be a license for parenting. <laughs> you know, you need a license for a car, but for bringing a human being into the world, no education? Is there any knowledge about how to deal with grief, loss, challenge, death? How is it we all go through life, but we are so underprepared? Is there a wisdom? There is a wisdom. In fact, there is an entire manual for life. This manual is at least 6,000 years old. So 4,000 BC, at least. It is from India, but it does not belong to India. It is everyone's. This wisdom is called Vedanta. Vedanta comes from two Sanskrit words. Veda means knowledge, Anta means end. So Vedanta is the complete knowledge of life. It takes us to the end of life. What is the end of life? It is the purpose of life. When you achieve the goal of life, finished. What is that goal of life? Complete satisfaction, complete fulfillment. The word is called paripurna. It means you are so full. Imagine you're eating, 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 and if you have just one more bite, it'll come out. You're so full of happiness, bliss. But it is not temporary, it's lasting. Today, we are going to analyze and question life. What is life? Anyone? A gift. A gift. Mm -hmm. Some might say a curse. A challenge. <laughs> challenge, okay, challenge, yes. A definition means it must be the same for everyone. What is life? We don't take time to learn about life. Why? We're too busy. Sorry? Too busy doing things. Too busy. Do you know the American poet, Henry David Thoreau? He says, we're so busy, busy, busy. We're busy doing what? We're busy being busy. And he says, look at the ants. The ants are also busy. <laughs> and we got busy, we got to drop the children off, pick the children, feed them, go to work, plan. Busy doing what? What is life? One, yes, we're busy. Second is, we don't know. My parents do not teach me. Our schools are not educating us with this knowledge of life. There are certain schools. They're trying, great. And the third one is, one more reason. Why don't we learn about life? There's a different for everybody. Different. Like, let's say different. You can say like, oh, for you life is best because everybody has a different purpose for living. And like, how would you say it? Like, because we also have a different word to mean the one thing. And sure. like, everybody has a, a one word with different meanings in his uh, mind. And how we can say the one word for everything. It's not possible just to... I'll give you, I'll give you... I'll give you a definition that can apply for everybody. Okay. Hang on. 
The one reason is sometimes we think we know. And when we say I know or I'm perfect, we stop learning. Today I came, I saw Ikigai. Diana presented me the book, I read the book because I like to learn. But if we think we know, we won't learn. So today, let us pretend we don't know. Let us just ask questions. And maybe something useful at the end of today. What is life? Can we all agree life begins at birth, ends at death, and between birth and death, this journey is called life? So life is this journey between birth and death. What does this journey comprise of? Learning. Experience. Learning. Experiences. Excellent. So life is, sorry? Given a new life. Given? A new life. A new life. Yes. Yeah. The purpose, but now people forgot about that. Yeah. Now people are not living with purpose. Life is made up of experiences. And an experience is a unit of life. So if you have many good experiences, good life. Bad experiences, sad experiences, bad life, sad life. So if we want happy life, good life, we need Happy, happy, good experiences. <laughs> now, if you want happy, good experiences, and now we start the philosophy. What do you need? If you want a happy experience, see it on the screen. Life is made up of experiences. But an experience is made up of two factors. And if we can teach this to our children, to ourselves, first of all, an experience is two factors. One is the world, the other is you. Now where are we putting in most of our effort to try and get a better experience? We are trying to improve the world. So we want better home, better car, nicer clothes, nice watch. We are improving outside things. We've got wonderful technology. We've got the projector, you pick up your phone, you can talk to your loved ones from across the world. In Mexico, South Africa, I'm from South Africa, India, my institute, I can talk to them. Although not now, now it's middle of the night. But technology has advanced. But would you say, People are happier? No. Maybe we figured out the mic because it's, I think the mic is gone off. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Technology fails. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. It, it was me. Uh, Diana. It was me. I was holding the button. <laughs> the problem is me. <laughs> It's not the world, it's not the microphone, it's me. But what do we want to do? We want to change outside. I don't like life, change the country. I don't like partner, change the partner. Some people want to change the children also. <laughs> we keep on trying to improve the world. So we have nicer houses, but broken homes. This subject is about how to improve yourself. Because if you improve yourself, you know the technique, you know the skill about how to meet the world so every experience is positive or learning. A disease, good or bad? Depends, depends. A challenging situation, good or bad? could change your life, could change the way you think. COVID, how was COVID in Dominican Republic? Depends. Some people said COVID was the best. For me, yes. Huh? Yeah, so I, I had time to myself. I could think such quality time with the family will never get that time. Other people said too much time with the family. <laughs> 
<laughs> Some people said, oh, good time for me to be alone. Some people said, I'm lonely. I'm depressed. It's all about how we relate. But do we have the technique to figure out how to relate? It is something like this. What is your favorite food? Um, Sorry? Vegetables. Vegetables? Me too. Uh -huh. Yours? Chocolate. Sorry? Chocolate. Chocolate. Uh -huh. One person likes vegetable. One person likes chocolate. Imagine from around the world all your favorite dishes. Okay? And it's hot and it's fragrant and there's also a dessert buffet of chocolate. Okay? It's all there in front of you. One problem, you have indigestion, <laughs> stomach is upset and that's what we're doing. Everything is okay, kids are lovely, partner is good, this Dominican Republic is beautiful and we travel around the world, beautiful country and yet something is missing. Now look at the opposite, if you are very hungry, you can enjoy toast and butter. Same thing. If we have an appetite for life, we can enjoy any experience. How? Just find something positive in the situation while they're studying. Like How? Learn from that. You're right. How? How do we find it? How does the different situation ask ask myself how does the different situation wants to show me? Great. So what are you using? Self self talk. Self-talk, yes. Self-talk. A conversation with ourselves. Where is this happening? In your mind. In your mind. Inside. So now, is everyone okay so far? Now we're going to go to the next level. Who are you? What makes you you? Every human being is made up of three equipments. Easy way to remember it. BMI. Not BMW. BMI. What does BMI stand for, anyone? You've heard of this before? Yeah, that's the wrong one. But that's the one we know, you know? It's so easy because outside is easy to fix, inside is difficult. Body mass index, right? Body, correct. We've got to change the M. Mind. I. Intellect. Intellect. Body, mind, and intellect. Here we go. Every human being is made up of a body, a mind, and intellect. The body is your vehicle. It's your car. It moves you from experience to experience. You can have a Fiat of a body. You can have a Chev. You can have a Ferrari of a body and crash it. What we're interested in, who's driving the body? And there are two drivers in your personality. And some of us may have studied psychology in university. So don't worry about the words so much. Because in different languages, in Spanish, mind might mean something else. You can call it A, B. Two types of thoughts. A, we call it the mind in this subject. The mind is that part of you which has the feelings, has the emotions, has the likes and dislikes. So like when I asked you, what's your favorite food? You said vegetables. If I say, what's your favorite color? Different. Different color. Rainbow. Green. Depends on the time of day. <laughs> your favorite color? Blue. Blue. One person likes blue. 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 One person likes blue. You know, one time I was asking in a classroom, what's your favorite color? Each person saying black, black. I'm looking for a little bit diversity. Everybody saying black, black, black. black. Sometimes it happens. Huh? Blue or white? Blue, okay, we got some diversity here. One person likes blue, one person likes white, one person likes... Green. Red, green. Red, green, thank you. Orange. Why? I just like it. Don't ask me for a thesis on it. I just like it. It's my preference. Why do I like chocolate? I just like it. That's the mind. 
So the mind has got the emotions, it's got the impulses, it's got the desires. It is the part of you which just flows and goes. The subconscious. But this subconscious, you may not have designed it consciously. It is there from your upbringing. It is there from your parents. It is there from your country. It is there, you are picking it up. It is from television, from what you see on social media, TikTok. It is all having an impact on your mind. We don't realize it. But there is a part of us which is different. It is called the intellect. And the intellect has the ability to be aware, weigh up the pros, weigh up the cons, come to a decision. It thinks, it reasons, it judges, it decides. Do you know, sometimes you can have an emotion, mind, but not be aware that you are going through the emotion? You can have an emotion, you're feeling it, you don't know you're feeling it, unless there's some intellect. Example, you can be in grief and not know you are grieving. You can be in depression, not know you are depressed. You can be angry and not know that you are angry. So one couple invited Avani and myself for dinner. And the lady is a student of mine. I've not met the husband, first time I'm meeting the husband. So we're having dinner, food is good, conversation is polite, it's going well. But in the middle of the conversation, we realized that the lady had a surprise attack because she suddenly says, Darling, why don't you tell Sudhakar, Sukha, that's me, about your problem? Husband, what problem, darling? <laughs> She's saying, no, 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 sweetie, Sudhakar is here, he's a student of the mind, he can perhaps help you, you know, you tend to get angry very quickly, you have a short temper. And the man starts, Sudhakar, I don't know what this woman has told you about me, I don't know when was the last time I was angry. <laughs> As he's saying it, this one vein is starting to swell. This one looks like it's going to pop. You know, I'm also moving just in case it bursts. As he's getting angry, he's not aware that he's angry. Now, in life, when we are thinking, when we are making decisions, when we are making choices to watch another episode of Netflix or study, Marius, what will we choose? Huh? Whether to wake up a little bit earlier and exercise or not. Whether to have another slice of cake or not. These are questions. Example, a diabetic. Diabetic we know. Not supposed to have too much? Sugar. We just came from Aruba. Aruba has high diabetes. So they could really understand this question because quite a few were diabetic in the audience. So I asked them, to this diabetic, I give some chocolate. Swiss chocolate. Ladderac, my favorite. I offer some Ladderac Swiss chocolate to the diabetic. What does the diabetic's mind say? Eat it. Why? I like it. I love it. I'm feeling for it. Mind says eat the chocolate before he changes his mind. What does the intellect say? You're gonna die. <laughs> You're gonna die. <laughs> Be dramatic. Not a good idea. Remember what happened last time? You had to go to the clinic, get the insulin injection. Don't eat it. But hang on. Intellect can also say, you have been very good this week. 
your sugar is low and this is very good chocolate thank you very much so intellect and mind can agree but the difference is the intellect reasons and decides mind just goes default setting immediate pleasure where can I get the next kick the next high the next pleasure So in our personality, let's say the mind says eat the chocolate, intellect says not even a bite. Why I'm saying this? Some of you will be diplomatic. I'll have a little piece, just a small piece. And that small piece becomes one more piece. And that one more piece becomes just half. And that half becomes whole bar is gone. I'm saying not even a bite. Mind says eat, intellect says not a bite. What will the diabetic do? Sorry? Eat it. You're right. It depends on the individual. Who is stronger in you? If the intellect is stronger in you, no problem. You won't eat the chocolate, but you'll take it from me and you'll give it to your child. But, and here is the scary part, if your mind is stronger than your intellect, even though you know you shouldn't do it, even though you know you will regret it, you will feel upset and guilty about it, you eat the chocolate, suffer the consequences. Now forget about the diabetic, you and me. What stops us from wanting to be calm and not angry? What stops us from driving without road rage? What stops us from being absolutely understanding and cool with our children? Our mind is strong, intellect is weak. And we've not generally been educated on how to develop the intellect. Presidents have lost the presidency over one desire. They can't control the desire. See, an animal, if an animal walks past, like there's a dog, and an animal sees an attractive mate passing by. An animal doesn't have an intellect. An animal has to act on the impulse, on the desire. But as human beings, if you see an attractive person going by, we should not act. Check, intellect, question, think. But some people are not able to control it because the desire is strong, intellect is weak. So what is the difference then? Okay, let me ask you this. Does anyone do a things to do list? Hmm? Like things that you need to do for the day? Yeah, 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 okay. All right, all right, most people. Okay, suppose you put 10 things to do for the day. On average, how many do you do? Seven. Mm -hmm. Average. Depends on the day is an excuse. What's the average? Half, half, half. Five, okay. Okay, five, seven, some people say two. Who's making the plan? You're making the plan. Hopefully with your intellect, you're making the plan. And when it comes to executing the plan, you will say, oh, Sudhakar, you know, there was some unforeseen emergency. You know, I had to do this and I had to do that. And uh, I had to put out a fire. And and uh, somebody died every day. <laughs> We're not able to do what we want to do because when we start, we should start. Six o'clock, we start, 7.30, end. But if you don't start on time, then it goes a little bit later, then dinner gets late, then you're missing the time with the family. And by the end of the day, you missed out on 30 to 40 percent. You know, businesses, they hire consultants for 3 percent, 4 percent increase in profit.
profitability, in optimization, we have a potential 40 to 50 percent improvement in our own personality. But we are going with the mind instead of the intellect. A meeting starts when it should start, ends when it should end. In fact, if there's one thing we leave with our children, the purpose of a parent, anybody? So, you know, like when I asked what is life, it'll be a good question to ask, what is parenting? What would be a good achievement as a parent? We see it in animals, for human beings. It's an important question. These are the questions we should be asking. Yeah, learn through life. Be present, excellent, very good. Legacy? What if it's a bad legacy? <laughs> <laughs> it's like the question of the challenge. Because of the challenge, yeah. They use it, use it to make you grow. If you think about it, an animal, a tiger, brings up the cubs. In the beginning, it's so protective. Until when? Until the cub is self-sufficient. Until the cub can manage for itself, then it's almost like, bye. Out you go. Go live your life. But as human beings, we get attached to our children. We want them to stay with us. We want them to depend on us, need us. Even now, if I call my mother, she will be, are you taking your vitamins? <laughs> Have you eaten today? So much of dependency. If you want to be a good parent, it's about making the child self-sufficient. How can that child be prepared for the world? Go out to the world and be ready for it. But for that, we need the intellect. To be an original thinker. To do things when it ought to be done, whether the mind likes it or not. Thomas Huxley. He says this, perhaps the most valuable result of all education is the ability to make yourself do the thing that ought to be done, whether you like it or not. It is the first lesson that ought to be learned. And however early a person's training begins, it is probably the last lesson a person learns thoroughly. The ability to do your duty. What has to be done? But who decides what has to be done? Your intellect. Not somebody else telling you. Your sister-in-law, your mother-in-law giving free advice. It is your intellect deciding two things. What are my roles? What are my goals? And anything that takes you towards your goal or your role is your duty. So I'm going to show you how, if we go with the mind, how it causes all the stress that we go through and why we need to bring intellect into our life. But before we get into that, what are we learning then in schools and universities? So everyone here has been through some form of education, intelligent people, all of us. But that does not mean we have an intellect. There is a difference between intellect and intelligence. I know a doctor, he's one of the top three cardiologists in London. Right. Do you have cardiologists here? Yeah, for the heart, right? Dominican Republic, we still have heart problems. Yeah. So, I thought, you know, with the beaches and everything, the heart is just taken care of. So this cardiologist, he is telling his patient all the usual heart advice. Reduce your stress, decrease your alcohol, decrease your smoking. He's telling patient after patient, reduce stress, decrease alcohol, decrease smoking. This cardiologist, he is a chain smoker. Between patients, he's having a puff. 
So patient goes, he opens the window, he airs the room, closes the window, next. My question to you is, does this cardiologist know what smoking is doing to his heart? Of course he does. He has written books on the subject. He's written journals on the subject. But though he knows it, does not mean he has the intellect strong enough to control the desire for the smoking. There is a difference between knowing and having the information. Information is overrated. We can get it from ChatGPT, Google. <laughs> it is the application of information that is important. And that is the intellect, the ability to think. And that's why it's so wonderful to see the group here in Dominican Republic taking aspects of the finishing, the finished school system. Because the idea is to think how to adapt, get the technique of thinking rather than the information. Because the information is accessible. You can hire information, but to apply it, to put it at the right time, right place, to the right situation, intellect. Now I'm gonna show you three ways the mind causes stress and why we need this intellect. And this would be the wisdom for life. The nature of everybody's mind. Number one, it generates desires. And desires cause you stress. Number two, it rambles. It's very restless. It doesn't like to be in the present. And number three, it gets attached. This is the destroyer of relationships. Why parents and children get estranged, brothers, sisters, when they grow up? Number one reason for divorce is not infidelity, it is attachment. We'll explain. Let's go, one by one. When are we happy? When do we experience pleasure, anybody? Happy moments? Yeah. So when are those moments? When I finish running. When you finish running? So when you finish your run, yeah? Sorry? When you get something, what you want. When you get what you want, simple. You get what you desire, you get what you want, pleasure. When are you unhappy? When you don't get what you want. See how beautiful, it's just logic. When you don't get what you want. Suppose you want to come for the lecture on time and there is traffic. What starts happening? You start getting angry. You start getting stressed. But suppose you've got nowhere to go. There's a good podcast, there's good music on the sound system. You're not stressed. Why? Because there's no desire to reach a place at a particular time. So it is the desire that causes stress. It is not getting what you want that's causing the noise, the chatter. Even now, suppose you have a desire for cigarette. You're in the lecture now, but in your mind, it's going cigarette. Cigarette, cigarette, as you're listening to me, cigarette, cigarette. If it's a medium desire, cigarette, 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 cigarette. If it's a strong desire, cigarette, 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 cigarette. Excuse me, and you leave, you go outside, you have a puff, and shanti. <laughs> Enlightenment. Peace. Why? All you've done is you created agitation and then you closed it temporarily. So the more desires we have, the more noise, the more stress in our life. So right now, the cigarette is going, cigarette, cigarette, cigarette. The holiday that you're waiting for is going, holiday, holiday, holiday. But you also have desires for, children must do well in school, do well in school, do well in school. Partner must be more understanding, partner must be more understanding, understand. This is all causing all the noise. What can we do about it? Because the trouble with the mind is, suppose you say, look, it's worth it. It is worth it to be this stressed. Okay. Everyone have something in mind? 
What happened when you got it? When you achieved it, what happened? <laughs> well, let's not be so pessimistic. We enjoyed it. We were happy. For how long? You know, the people who come to this subject, everyone has a story. There was one business person. He started his business as an entrepreneur. From his garage, at 20 years old, it became a national franchise. And he was working for so many years for the ideal sale. He lists the company, he sells it. Next day, goes into depression. And he's like, what is wrong with me? I was working for this my whole life. Some people are working for a time. I'm working. And whatever you've not used for the last year, why are you keeping it? <laughs> to, I believe this is mainly for gents, but how many watches do you have? I don't have watches. I was asking the person behind you. <laughs> Two watches. So this gentleman wants more time on his hands. <laughs> Say, uh, Western time, Eastern time, okay? Okay, we can understand two watches. You got two wrists, two watches, fine. One for sport, one for life. Going out. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. You could even justify four watches, you know, one on your wrist, uh, one on your ankle, other ankle, four watches. But then a person has got, we ask somebody, six watches. What are you doing with six watches? Give two away. So in one lecture, we're asking this question and ask the gentleman, how many watches do you have? And he said, no, don't ask me. I said, okay. <laughs> we went to the next person and carried on. How many watches do you have? Five. Why do you need five? Reduce. This gentleman, he came up later and he said, I didn't want to tell you because I have a feeling my wife told you before the lecture. <laughs> So, no, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He's saying, no, my wife told you. I don't know who your wife is. He's saying, because you asked me, you picked me out of the audience, I have 55 watches. Not Casio and Seiko. <laughs> the Swiss watches and he's saying what do I do with them can I give them to you don't pass your disease <laughs> get me in trouble with customs give your family give your friends what are you doing in the cupboard pass it on pass it on otherwise this is where it is taking up your mental peace your space reduce the desires that you don't think are necessary because they're stressing you out. You know when your phone is starting to slow down, what do you do? You start closing the apps. <laughs> Same thing with your mind. And the second way, very practical technique, is let us learn to be rich, not poor. You're saying, that's what I'm trying. No. Richness is not in the figure. Suppose you told me, $25 million is enough to have a great life. I would have achieved that 10 years ago. But it's not there. The person at 25 wants 50. The person at 50 wants 100. And so it continues. Here's how. This evening, we can all leave rich. Because it's not in the quantum. It's about how you feel about what you have. See this equation. A rich person is one whose wealth, what they have, is more than what they desire. Then you feel abundant. Oh, I have so much. I can spare. You feel charitable. You feel kingly, even if it's a little. I remember growing up, and I come from a business family, and because there were three of us and we had so many activities, my parents had a driver that would 
do some of the picking up and dropping off. And I saw the driver at the office, he was giving money to some of the admin staff. So I asked him one day, hey, his name was Indran. Indran, what are you doing? Because I thought maybe he's doing some side deal. And he said, Sudhakar, you know how it is. I said, no, I don't. He says, it's end of the month. They are running out of cash. So I'm lending them for the last few days. I said, but Indran, they get paid more than you. He says, the company pays me very well. It's more than I need. I lend them first of the month, I get it back. Who is rich, who is poor? Indran is rich. Then you read some article of a millionaire that is complaining about inflation. Can't service his yacht. You feel so bad for him, you know, say, okay, yes, $10, you know, all the way for your fund, your yacht fund. Who is rich who is poor it's about how you feel when do you become a poor person a poor person is when your desires overtake your wealth then you feel insufficient something missing so if you want to get back to feeling rich content just manage the desires the intellect manages the desires but does that make us stagnate does that make us not ambitious no as long as you are content stay content but do not pitch your present happiness on something in the future when I get that I will be happy why should we not pitch our present happiness on the future it's unknown excellent you may not get it great even if you do get it your mind will pitch up something else. So your whole life, you are discontent. But look at it the other way around. Let me learn to be happy right now with what I have. I have a healthy family. I can breathe, I can run, I can think. I got my health. When you are content, then you can think better, you can perform better. So if you increase, if you can increase your wealth, then increase your desires, no problem. You stay rich, you stay content your whole life. And it's a choice. Why are we choosing the alternative? Let us reprogram our thinking with our intellect. Now the second way the intellect can be used in life is, somebody said earlier, one thing I'd like to teach my kids is being present. How? The mind's nature is to go into the past, go into the future. Even now in this session, if any of you have been with me for 50% of the time, thank you very much. <laughs> But the mind goes for a wonder, it goes for a trip. And, you know, perhaps you're thinking of a blue and white dress. One person's thinking about what vegetables I'm going to have for dinner. I say, come back, come back, come back. Be here, be with me. Be in the present. It's so important to be in the present for two reasons. Number one, when your mind is somewhere else, that present action gets diluted. If you are cooking a meal and your mind is somewhere else, please don't invite me for dinner. <laughs> because your mind is not there. You don't know what's going inside or what ingredient is missed. Similarly, in a conversation, and here's the thing, our family, our partners, they don't need quantity of time. They need quality of time. Are you available? Are you present? But we go with all the day's happenings. We're preoccupied. We go in. How do you feel after your work day? Exhausted. Yeah. All right. So you're going with, you're on reserve. And then you're going home to a family, to children who are looking forward to interacting with you. And you've got nothing. You don't have that availability to be with them. Be present. I would say, before you walk into the house, 
take a 10 minute breather. Walk around the car, walk around the house, give yourself a pep talk and say, look, I am choosing to go and relate and have a good evening with the family. If you're on reserve, don't go in. Go in saying, I want to interact, be with the family. Why? Because that's what I've chosen to do. Whatever you decide to do, do it 100%. If you decide to work, be in the work 100%. But now, when we go to work, we're thinking about home. When we go home, we're thinking about the office. When you're at the golf course, you're thinking about the deal. When you're at golf, be at golf. When you're in the spa, be in the spa. You're going for a walk, have a walk. When you're with the family, be there. Now I see, we went for dinner the other day and I saw a whole family having dinner at the restaurant. And I said, this is so nice to see, this is rare. Except one problem. All of them were on their phones. So let's give them benefit of the doubt. Maybe they're texting each other. <laughs> what do you think we should order? What should we get? And I'm watching this because that is my National Geographic. I'm watching people. Airports and restaurants, fascinating. And I'm watching and then the food comes. And when the food comes, what do people do? What do people do when the food comes? You would think they would eat it. And it's hot and it's like you've ordered it. And the daughter is telling the mother, Mom, can you move out of the frame? You're spoiling the picture. No, Mom, Mom. Tempted, you know, I want to go and tap them and say, sorry, your food is getting cold. But why are they taking a picture of the food? To share it with Social media, right? Share it. What's the psychology? Why are they doing that? Sorry? sending photos of our food. It's such a strange thing. <laughs> they want to show, people want to show, this is what you are missing out on. This is what I'm enjoying. But actually I'm not enjoying because I'm taking a photo of what I should be enjoying. <laughs> Be in the present. Why is it that our first inclination, when we see something beautiful, we want to put a phone in between? <laughs> Be in the present. Number one tool of distraction and destruction, mobile phone. The mobile phone is a great tool, but it's a tool for you to use, not it using you. And unfortunately, the algorithms of the people on social media is meant to capture your attention, is meant to engage you. The people who run these platforms do not give the mobile phone to their kids. <laughs> because they know what they're doing. It's good marketing. It is written to engage, capture, attention. But we can choose. If you don't need your phone, small things, and you've got to decide, you've got to come up with it. Tell the family, we're having dinner together, no phones, everybody put the phones in the basket. When you're going to sleep, everybody keep the phones on the charging station, everybody go to your rooms. Here's a normal alarm. You don't need your phone to wake up. We've got to become creative to figure out how to deal with this distraction, this temptation. We're also guilty of it. Uh, we say to unwind, let me do some scrolling. Uh, and so a thousand people can put me to bed. <laughs> And then when I wake up, I allow a thousand people into my mind to wish me good morning. <laughs> Cut. Be in the present. Hmm? And the second thing is, when your mind is not in the present, past, future, past, future, it's anxious about the future, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, it's regretting all the things that happened in the past, maybe some trauma. 
This is what makes us tired. If you want energy, and the other is if you want to stay and look young, be in the present. My teacher will show you a video of him. He's 97 years old. Okay? He was playing cricket, uh, a sport, a few years ago. He was driving 200 kilometers, 200 kilometers. Traveling to 14 countries a year in his 90s, so full of energy. And he was on the front page of the Washington Post. And one of our followers, the daughter, saw my teacher on the front page. And she said, Dad, Dad, your Swami, your guru, he's on the front page. And he was so happy. He was American and he said, Oh, Oh, darling, any questions you have for Swami, I can ask him. Because he was happy, you know, she's taking an interest in this philosophy. So, she said, Dad, I have one question for him. He said, what, what? Can you ask him, what moisturizer does he use? <laughs> the secret that he gave to people who ask, how are you so young? How do you have so much energy? No worries of the past, no anxieties for the future. Your intellect has got to keep your mind on the present and one useful tool is to schedule your day. From morning to night, from the time you wake up, have an activity where you think your mind should be. So when your mind starts going for a walk, intellect says, hey, hang on, you're supposed to be with the family now. You can even slot in social media. Say from 8 to 8.30, I just want to check my social media. But schedule it so you're not diluting all your actions through the day. The last way the mind causes stress is through attachment. Attachment destroys relationship because we see each other, not strangers, the people close to us. This is why it's so sad. The people close to us, we treat the worst. We say that we love them, but love means understanding them, feeling one with them. When you understand a person, there cannot be conflict confrontation. It's when we think or love with our mind, where we see the person how we would like them to be. So I love my husband, but, uh, but if they could just change this, if they could just change that, and you know my son, wonderful boy, but he needs to be more focused. In fact, he needs this lecture. So many buts. So our relationships today are like this. I love you. Asterisks. Terms and conditions apply. <laughs> you as long as you're smiling when I come home. I love you as long as uh, food is ready. I love you as long as you listen to my problems. I love you as long as some people complain. My husband doesn't like to gossip with me huh? or vice versa. I love you as long as I've got so many but, 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 but. I love you means I love you period. There are some qualities you may like, some qualities you may not like. But seeing the person as the package, accepting them as the package is love. Then what do you do? You say, my kid, so lazy, so lazy. What do I do? Should I just accept him? Uh, you've got to figure out ways to go about it. But don't make the love conditional on the quality. Love them as they are. They may change, they may not change, but by you not wanting them to change, by you not being so stressed that they change who they are, that is what brings the understanding. See the person in front of you, not the person in your mind. 
the tip or the strategy is let us assess with our intellect each person you don't have to assess you know, the shopkeeper assess your family members those close to you what is my partner like all right so you can put my husband kind excellent chef short tempered punctually unpunctual by half an hour <laughs> this is an assessment don't make it judgment don't put a criticism on it just facts whenever we go out he will be half an hour late so if your intellect accepts it and understands it then it can adapt and adjust so if you have to leave at 6 p.m. what time do you tell your husband to be ready 5 30 p.m. right and then when your husband comes down half an hour late why because that's the nature at 6 p.m. and comes and like come on come on let's go now we're getting late <laughs> and sees you very calm very zen <laughs> said, what happened to you why are you not why are you so calm <laughs> Vedanta <laughs> you've done is assessed and understood the person as they are and if you come from that level of understanding there is a chance that they may be receptive to what you have to say but the problem we make as parents and people who want to influence others we make a double fault all parents please listen to this teachers as well the double fault is, one, we give sermons, lectures, two, we don't follow the way. We don't set an example. So we tell the children, go to bed early, but we stay up afterwards. We tell the children, be punctual, but we're not punctual. We tell the children, treat each other with respect, but we're not treating our partner with respect. Two things. Stop giving lectures, especially for those of you who have large teams. Less lectures, less instructions, and lead the way. Leading the way is the most powerful way to parent. Children want to absorb from you. They want to see you as a role model. But when we tell them what to do, the nature of the mind is rebel. But if you can drop the expectation and just set the example, there's a chance they might follow. Abraham Lincoln, he says, there is just one way to bring up a child in the way he should go, and that is to travel that way yourself. Albert Einstein says there is setting an example is not the main means of influencing others it is the only means see if your example is attractive people should come to you and they should be like hey Eduardo what are you on they should be like you look happy tell me what's your secret what are you taking that's what it should be. You make yourself so attractive, people want to know. They want to take it from you. They want to come and ask your opinion. Mom, what do you think I should do? Even then, when they finally ask you, don't be, oh, I've been waiting my whole life for this opportunity. <laughs> sit down, sit down, sit down. Huh? And you give all the list of things on your mind. Inside, just relax things and people will be what they are even your child your child has their own personality already our role just guide as indirectly as possible less instructions more example this is leadership i want to leave you with one quote on leadership it's by an archbishop and it's about people who want to change and they might want to change for good reasons but this is perhaps the best way to go about it an archbishop he wrote this on his on his crypt on his tombstone 
He says, when I was young and free and my imagination had no limits, I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change. So I shortened my sights somewhat and decided to change only my country. But it too seemed immovable. As I grew into my twilight years in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only my family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have none of it. And now, as I lie on my deathbed, I suddenly realize if I had only changed myself first, then perhaps, by example, I would have changed my family. From their inspiration and encouragement, I would then have been able to better my country. And who knows, I may have even changed the world. All wisdom, whether it be for life or for leadership, starts with you. Make some time every day to develop your intellect. We do so much for the body. We bathe it, we exercise it, we feed it, pamper, beautify it. So much for the body. What are we doing for the mind and the intellect that is responsible for our happiness, for our choices? Zero. If you have found this lecture provocative, getting us to think, question, because from the questions come potential improvement, make it a part of your day. And I would say the first part of the morning, before the kids wake up, before you attend to your duties and emails, spend that first half an hour either with literature, gaining knowledge about how to improve your intellect. And the three books I would recommend are, now don't read these as novels. Just read a few pages, maybe five pages, think about it and move on. Now the first book is The Fall of the Human Intellect. And one of our students who did the three year course at the academy, <laughs> Fernando, Alvarez, he translated this book, so the Spanish version is available. And this explains the mind, intellect, intelligence. The second book is about the application of the intellect in work and at home. So very important. This is a very practical book. It talks about leadership, stress, time management, productivity, parenting. And the last book, that book took 25 years to write. It is the wisdom of the world written in modern language. And it's when your intellect is so strong, it starts asking the bigger questions in life. What is the purpose of life? How do I get there? So depending where you are, go for it. So first book, second book, third book. Yes. Sorry, what's the name of the last book? It's called Vedanta Treaties. So Vedanta, the subject, Treaties, the Eternities. And um, I'm going to invite you also to come visit us in India, where Eduardo spent two weeks. Two weeks. He spent two weeks with us, so you're welcome to visit any time. But we have retreats where people from around the world come. So you can come any time, but this is the best time. One is in July, coming up, and this one you can come with the family. You can bring kids. Okay. So this is it. It's outside Mumbai. All right. So you can fly to uh, New York, and then New York directly to. Mumbai and uh, the other one is in February and the February is more of a, an executive retreat so for those of you who are leaders you have large teams that's an interesting retreat where you get to interact with people who are also from professional backgrounds so that might be an option but for the kids the best time for the kids is either in June or in December. So we have twice a year youth camps. It's for five days and it is from the ages of nine to 23. So we split the classes but what I can tell you is and this is what attracted me to the subject is it seems like life is getting harder 
And I think for a youngster, you just don't really know where to go to deal with challenge. Mm -hmm. And coming from this experience, it's not like overnight you become a different person, but you get the tools. And you realize, actually, life can be pretty great, but I need to work at it. So I think this might be a great exposure for the kids. And lastly, if you're interested, all of this information is available on our website. That is my personal WhatsApp details. So if you message me, say, hi, I'm, I came for the lecture. And if you have any questions, you can let me know and I'll answer your questions from your reading or from watching the lectures. So on the website, we have a full introductory course available if you want to explore deeper. All in all, to quote Rumi, Yesterday, I wanted to change the world because I was smart. Today, I am wise, so I'm changing myself. Gracias, everyone.